Hello and welcome. Um, I'm glad we don't have to overcome this lunch kind of coma because we can literally eat all day, which does not make life easier for us. Um, so my name is Marcus. I'm obviously a German. You can follow my ramblings and rantings on Twitter at my fear if you like. I do work for Red Hat and this slide still says developer advocate, which is only half of what I do, but let, let's just imagine that I do the speaking thingy regularly. If you want to see me and hear more about me, there's a fair chance I'll be at one of these conferences or some more that I've spoken before. Um, I do have opinions and I'm a middleware guy and I'm a developer advocate. So how is that guy actually supposed to talk about stuff? And uh, usually I don't really ramble about myself too long just want to do a little bit of level setting because there's so much infrastructure talks here so you guys don't ask me the wrong questions later on, right? <laughs> so I have a middleware history. I've been a consultant in the field for almost 14 years before I embarked in sh sharing my knowledge and speaking at conferences. So when I first came in contact with containers, that was actually OpenShift 2.x. And uh, after that, I had the pleasure to embark on this journey throughout OpenShift where it is today, still keeping a solid eye out on, on all of the middleware parts and my most favorite language, was, which is Java, right? So today, I brought you a little bit of an agenda. I do know that we only have 25 minutes and this is probably going to be the biggest challenge today. Um, but I do want to encourage you to ask your questions. So if something comes up, don't wait for the end. Don't think for 30 minutes, just fire it well, because I do believe that asking questions is the only way to actually learn more. So keep that as one lesson from today. Um, yeah, containers. Containers, why containers? Um, who's using containers, like day to day? Who is actually a software developer employed and earning money? Okay, what are you other guys doing? <laughs> Students? Yeah, okay, fair enough. So who's, who's using containers already? Wonderful, so I'm, I'm gonna skip this. It's easy, it's fast, it's way better. So just a couple of years ago when I worked for very big German automotive OEMs, um, we had a nice deliverable format for enterprise Java applications. Anybody wanna guess what that was? Tar files, surprise, surprise. And they did not only contain the ER file itself of an application server deployment, but also the complete configuration of the application server of choice, um, which could have been anything blue and red or even redder. <laughs> so um, it, was, it was a nightmare. Uh, and putting this into production obviously had a bunch of challenges that containers kind of are overcoming these days. Um, which I also like a lot is that our toolbox is expanding like by the very minute by not being bound to blueprints and corporate recommendations how to use Java the right way in enterprise settings um, we actually have a fat chance to employ something new something else because the interface between dev and ops is kind of becoming the container image and if you really think about it, we've been living in containers all our lives, right? I mean, not at home, but our laptop is kind of a contained environment. A virtual machine is a contained environment. And now we slimmed that down to the bare minimum and are running it. So this is, this is a pretty neat way of delivering applications. And I'm, I'm buying it, seriously. Um, but is that container and Java thingy still a good idea? Um, I think this is a Google search trend. I'm not completely sure. If we look at uh, what happened to Java, so that when I started my career back in 2002 and even earlier, um, that was still a really, really decent language and probably the number one most used language in, in the enterprise. Um, as you can easily see here, our choice is broad, right? So people are starting to use different things 
For example, Go. Who's using Go as a programming language? Yeah, a couple of hands. Who's not using Java on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, also four to five. We're getting there, right? Just a couple of years ago when I asked that question in front of an audience, every single hand would stay down on the table um, because Java was the only choice. To me personally, this is what I feel about Java. <laughs> this is a nice picture taken by a fellow dev advocate now working for JetBrains, and I think it kind of nails what I think about Java and how I wanted to use it. So we have Java as a set goal for me personally. We have containers as a set goal for companies to run applications going forward. Where do I start? I think whenever somebody is complaining about Java, the first thing they're complaining about um, actually is the size of Java itself, right? So just for the sake of comparison, um, I looked at this little slide and uh, you can see the average Docker size image for various JDK base images that are provided, right? So one thing sticks out that is Alpine with OpenJDK 8, but that's, that's, a, that's a huge number, like 500 megabytes just for the base image to run our custom applications. That's a neat thing. Alpine, obviously the best among all of them. What do we do with Alpine? Um, I think it's a, it's a good way to start development, right? It's a, it's a very simple, very flat image. Um, there are a couple of drawbacks, especially if you run it with anything else than Java 8. So here's a little, little red subtitle link. You'll find that at the bottom of my slides very often. And I call this homework. So first of all, it's 20 minutes. That doesn't really leave me enough of room to dig into individual topics. And second of all, um, I only just recently uh, realized how much I personally hate homework. I always, like in school, it was a <laughs> tedious task to do, but now I have two wonderful girls and they have to do homework. Oh God, you have no idea how much I hate homework now. So I don't want you to hate it. I want you to pick and choose and match what you're interested in. Um, but yeah, find these on the bottom of the slides and I'm promising I get them to you. How else could we try to aim at a very small base image, right? I mean, there's another option, which is uh, something from Google, um, distroless container images. Um, it's, it's literally a complete, complete tool set um, that provides you a really customized, stripped down uh, base image for your applications. It actually supports more than Java, but it's, uh, it's an interesting way. Does size really matter? Does it? Is size the only thing we need to care for when we're running Java in containers? Come on, wake up. Suggestions, hands, ideas. We're not going to let you sleep. Size actually does probably not matter. You're already there. And uh, the answer is caching, right? So if we imagine we have an insanely large base image. This might even contain an application server of any choice because it has to and the customer asks for it and you can't use Quarkus. Um, then you probably are going to build a bunch of more images with just 20 meg of your custom source code for your application. The handcrafted lovely piece that you've been spending your weekends on. So the average container size here, the average image size calculated by these uh, 10 images is 118 megabytes. If you change the base image a lot and just keep your custom code the same, you end up using a lot more, obviously, on average. So ultimately, depending on how you build your images, size might matter or it does not. Mostly, it does a little, right? So it's important 
to reduce your image size, but not for the, say, for the sake of size. We need to make sure to reduce risk vectors. We need to make sure to reduce um, everything that could potentially harm our infrastructures, everything that um, increases complexity in those applications that we are running, right? Um, disk usage itself is not the big problem in clusters. What you really need to care about is how effectively can you track these container images? How timely is working with these images? How fast can you update your application code? Just thinking of the software development lifecycle that you now have to go through, imagining that you still build images locally, at least for, for test purposes, seriously, that sucks. Like, <laughs> building an image that takes like five minutes um, I, I don't want to do this regularly. And yeah, security, I already mentioned. Um, did I mention that I work for Red Hat? Um, I do. And of course, there is something that I want you to take a look at if you haven't already. There is something that is called the universal base image. Um, this is a rel for containers. And there are actually three different flavors that you can use. Uh, the smallest, Flavor actually is roughly 80 megabytes big. So if you're really looking for a very small supported container base image that you can use for your Java applications, this is exactly what you're looking for. Um, advertising, um, if you're looking for a fast registry, look at Quay. Um, application layers I mentioned. So building these images the right way is obviously the key to building your right Java images in containers. Um, if you just look at that simple flow from build to a base image on the top and your application layer on the, on the bottom, you see that the base image is cached anyway most of the time as it should be and your application is actually sent over again as a new image layer every time. If you now start to decompose your application in a way that reflects the frequency of changes to the individual parts, you can even slim this down to the bare minimum that is needed when it comes to changes and image sizes being pushed by updates. Ideally, you end up having the smallest layer being pushed for updates, which increases your local development experience in, in just un, unexpressible times, right? <coughs> Speaking in Docker files, that might actually make it a little bit easier for all of us, um, which means we definitely keep all dependencies that don't change that frequently, hopefully, we keep all resources, like images, whatever you need for your application, and uh, we also separate out the application classes, the stuff that contains our viable IP, right? So uh, if we build this for a simple main class in Java, you get the ideal image layering that will definitely improve your development experience on Java. Um, is that all? Just container size. Today is all about clouds, right? So ultimately, cloud to me always is about money because we have to pay for resources. Um, no matter what I do and which awful vendor without OpenShift I use, um, you will have to pay for what you do. And Java, honestly, historically is not really good in resource restriction resource usage. It's always been optimized for ideal performance and a high throughput. So if you look at your Java application's memory usage over time, when you start it, it takes a while to actually ramp up the JVM startup phase. It has a little bit of an overuse bubble on top, which basically uh, which basically is an overpeak usage that happens because of garbage, garbage collection from the startup phase. 
And only after the, the time, the JVM kind of comes into swing and gets to the final memory consumption that you actually want to see. Why is over peak usage awful and why don't we want to have startup lag? Two questions. We've, we've lived with that for ages, right? Um, think serverless. Think containers that actually need a spin up for a couple of seconds, do their job, and kill themselves, controlled by Knative, for example. This is probably a really bad scenario for a JVM that actually needs to spin up and after, only after a certain time reaches the real warm up phase, right? And over peak usage, that is the stuff you pay for. So if you, if you have to assign 500 megabytes more RAM to each individual instance, you'll have to pay for that on an hourly basis, right? So if you want to save time and money, and if you even want to be able to support workloads that are a little bit more serverless, you want something like this. You want a startup that is insanely fast, that respects system boundaries and has no over peak usage in any way. Um, and this is saving you money because you're only paying for what you really get. There's a bunch of runtimes out there. People keep asking me what they should use. Obviously, it's OpenJDK supported on RHEL by Red Hat. Um, if that is not your answer, um, here are a couple of more. Um, for the sake of completeness, I think um, I mentioned some here, especially the Oracle one is something that we really shouldn't use anymore. Um, another thing I said, over peak usage is bad. Um, which Java version should we use? Like, can Java control itself? Can a JVM accept external assumptions about how much memory or threads or CPUs it has? Yeah, obviously not. I mean, it can after 8U131. This is actually the first version that is suitable to run in containers because you have a bunch of uh, compiler flags that you can set and that make sure Java is not consuming more resources than uh, are assigned to the, in the running pod, right? Um, if you use earlier Java versions, you'll frequently see Java out of memory exceptions during runtime because Java just assumes this is mine. I see everything and I want to use it. So um, memory configuration, I'm definitely going to blow through this because there's no time left. Um, more container awareness came in the next Java versions. So somebody in the Java community realized that containers are not going to go away anytime soon. Like we all have to accept that microservices are a thing or serverless. So they started doing a lot more work around container awareness, um, controlling Java within these resource bound environments, um, which helped us a lot. Java 11 took that even a little bit further. And if you look into the next versions, there'll even be more support around developer tooling. Um, so I think the message these slides are, um, are sending is basically the Java ecosystem cares. The people who are hoarding the Java community are pretty much aware that containers are a thing. And they are trying to improve the runtime instead of throughput and performance to actually reflect the requirements that containers put on them, right? Watch out for all these. Uh, these are actually JDK, um, I think, bug numbers. Um, it's ultimately always bound to a, a Java enhancement process kind of entry. You want to do troubleshooting and monitoring on the JVM? There's a lot. Like OpenShift offers a lot out of the box as the number one wonderful container runtime that you can even distantly think of. But there's also other tools. So um, consider this homework. What else do I have? Our typical build process actually changes a little bit. Um, this is the slide for the classical Java developer that wants to get into containers. Instead of having this, this one build step, we now have two build steps and a publishing step. It's a little bit more like all of us are from, from today on releasing Maven artifacts, right? This is how it always feels to me. Pushing an image is some kind of a heavyweight release process. 
Unfortunately, it is what it is, and this is the world we're living in. Um, there's only so much we can do about it. I do think that I have a slide. Um, you've heard a lot about Bilda, Potman, and Scopio already, if you've been to the right talks. Um, there's a nice little overview blog post here that uh, really gives you a deep dive. Fair warning, all of this does not work on Mac OS or Windows yet, so it's all Linux and RHEL based. Um, please don't even try if you're using one of these others. Um, as a Java developer, um, I don't, like seriously, I don't, I don't care. I, I wanna build my software, right? Um, this all is uh, awful. So how to make this life easier, our lives easier as Java developers? Um, there's a little bit of Fabric 8 um, that, is still, that, that is still maintained. Fabric 8 is kind of lingering away, but Fabric 8 is definitely maintained. Um, Spotify thought this is awful because it was not from them, so they created another Docker Maven plugin. Awesome. Um, there's also just the simple hack to do everything with Maven Exec yourself, like uh, build your images. I uh, don't even think this is not elegant. This is awful. Um, and there's Google, because they also didn't like what all the others did. They did something new. Fair. Um, the same for Gradle. Um, other players, I guess you can mix and choose and match whatever suits you best. Um, it's your little build help us. If you're completely up to speed and in the microservices kind of ecosystem and you really want to build small services, you don't want to build your images every time, you want to have an awesome developer experience, you absolutely need to look into Quarkus as a framework. Um, it is not mitigating all the problems Java has, but it's mitigating your developer life because everything is so much simpler. If you haven't looked at Quarkus yet, this is like the number one homework to take home because I'm going to test you about it. Um, ODO, um, if you have OpenShift, if you're lucky enough, um, you can definitely use something that I call a developer CLI. And that this is recorded, but I'm still saying, I love the CF push experience, right? Have you ever played around with Cloud Foundry? Like back in the days when it was still famous, people could just push their local project into the cloud and it worked. Um, this is for OpenShift, right? Um, if you don't want to mingle around with Cube, CTL, or whatever it's called these days, um, this is your solution. We also have a bunch of IDE integrations that make your life so much easier. VS Code, IntelliJ, even Microsoft is picking that stuff up and putting it into their Azure DevOps because OpenShift also runs on Azure, obviously. Um, if there's some IDE missing here that you want support for, please don't hesitate to send me an email. More than happy. Want to learn more than I could just push out in 20 minutes with 150 <coughs> slides. Um, this is your go-to point to register. Developers.redhat.com has everything you ever wanted when it comes to Red Hat technologies. Um, there are developer licenses for RHEL. There is OpenShift um, container, uh, code-ready containers that you can download and have your little own OpenShift on your laptop. Um, yeah, register, it's free. Somebody said, um, put this slide up. And I'm, uh, yeah, okay, will do. Um, so I'm actually a rehire in Red Hat. So I've been at Red Hat four years ago. Uh, did uh, a little bit of exploring on the West Coast and uh, US-based startups. Uh, that was super interesting, I learned a lot. But the one company I couldn't stop thinking about coming back to was Red Hat. Here I am, thank you for having me. If you wanna have that same kind of community experience, Please visit us, come to the booth. Thank you, questions. So fair warning, I won't be uh, around for long because I have to drive back to Munich five and a half hours. But as I said, I've been taking questions on Twitter, um, DM me, uh, DMs are open. Marcus is at Red Hat is my email. Um, so if something's not been covered, if I did something awfully wrong that you know better about, also please feel free to reach out. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful rest of the conference.